This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the overview of clinical infectious diseases with a focus on diagnostic testing. So our learning objectives today are to describe common tests used to identify pathogens that cause infection, recognize the limitations of some of these different testing modalities, know that identification of an organism does not always equate with presence of infection, and just going to touch on some of the new molecular tests able to identify pathogens. So how do we go on to make a diagnosis of a pathogen causing an infection? Well, there are numerous different ways to do that, but I kind of categorize them into three different groups. Direct identification, using immunological um, testing, and, some, and molecular testing. So what are the direct identification methods that we use? So differential staining of infected tissues or fluids are used very commonly, where you actually take infected tissue and you apply some stain to it and you look at it under the microscope. The other way you can do it is, is you can do culture. So you could take some of that tissue, put it on an enrichment medium that would maybe help a bacteria grow, allow it to incubate for 24 hours, and then see if you can get the bacteria to reproduce and then you can have more um, numbers, and then you can do some testing on that live bacteria. You can also do immunologic testing where you actually use the immune response to identify the pathogen. And then there's some molecular tests that we'll talk about. So staining and culture of infected tissue. So direct staining of tissue, as I said, is where you take, you, you can do this very quick identification of pathogen with something like a gram stain. In, in probably less than 15 minutes, you'll have some information about what organisms are there. But it's not going to tell you a specific species. It's not going to tell you about which antibiotics will necessarily work. Um, you can also do culture of tissue. And that, as I said, is really much more helpful. Um, it'll allow you to identify organisms down to a species level and do antibiotic testing. However, it takes some time. It may take two, three, four days before you actually know what species of pathogen it is and which antibiotics might work. This is an example of a direct stain of fluid from a wound. This is a gram stain um, from a wound, and you can see that there are some, uh, the red uh, circles are neutrophils, and then you can see the grape-like clusters of Staphylococcus, likely Staphylococcus aureus, and you're able to get that information in a very short period of time. But you just know that it's likely a Staph species because it's gram-positive coccyon clusters. So if you're going to do a culture, though, you're going to take some of that um, infected fluid, for example, you're going to rub it on a uh, agar plate and you're going to cook it over a 24 hour period and then when you get it back you can see a number of these colonies you can get some information even by the way that it looks on the agar plate you can see this kind of white halo around it that suggests that these colonies are beta hemolytic or they're um, they result in beta homo and complete hemolysis of the agar which might be suggestive of one organism over another you're going to then do a gram stain, and then you're going to see you have gram-positive coccyon clusters, which will be suggestive, although not for sure, staff. Um, you could then do a catalase test. Catalase test is commonly used to differentiate staph versus strep um, species, and if yours has is a catalase-positive uh, pathogen, like this one here, um, that is going to suggest that it's staph, not strep. But you're not going to know what species it is until you do another test. So this is then you go on and let's say you do a catalase test and the catalase test may be positive and you could see that the um, serum in that tube congealed, it's uh, stuck up, um, gravity normally would have it kind of come down like this and that suggests that coagulase was present which is suggestive that not only this is a staph species but it's staph aureus. And then you could plate this bacteria on um, another auger plate and place antibiotic discs. Uh, these antibiotic discs will seep out into the agar, and if the bacteria are not able to grow up to it, that means that they are susceptible to that antibiotic, and you could say, well, it's susceptible to whatever that disc is, and that helps you identify which antibiotics would work. As I mentioned, gram stain is probably the most common stain used for direct identification of pathogens, bacteria that is. 
Um, and it is the gram um, stain that differentiates between gram positive organisms and gram negative. And when you look at what, compo what makes up the cell wall of a gram positive uh, organism, um, you can see that it's this peptidoglycan layer is super thick in organisms that are gram positive, whereas in gram negative organisms, it's really small. And so when you're doing gram staining, the gram stain is taken up by this peptidoglycan layer and allows it to be this purple color in gram positive organisms. However, it's not taken up well in gram negative organisms, and therefore the purple doesn't stick, and you, you do a counter stain uh, with iodine and it stains this red oranges color and so gram negative organisms are going to look like this This is gram negative rods and then gram positive are going to be uh, This purple color which will help you differentiate between certain classes and guide potentially some empiric antibiotic therapy They come in lots of different forms. You can have a cocci which is round the cocci can be pulled together in chains It can be together in clusters. It can be in pairs here like a diplococci you could have rods like I showed you with that gram negative before, or you can even come in spirochetes. So like for example, with syphilis or Lyme disease, there are spirochetes and there are these long squiggly lines. So the gram stain is helpful for certain bacteria, but it doesn't help with everything. And so for certain organisms, like the, some of these that you've probably heard of, like malaria, gram stain is not helpful. Tuberculosis doesn't get picked up by a gram stain. Giardia, which is a protozoa, does not. Cryptococcus, which is a fungus, isn't easily identified by gram stain either. So you need to have other uh, stains in your arsenal and, and uh, we're not gonna go into a lot of that detail, but there are a number of other stains out there that help you ident identify some of these other pathogens like Giemsa stains and acid fast stains, etc. I wanna highlight one important thing that identification of a pathogen on a patient is not mean, does not equal infection all the time. Um, I had talked about uh, in another lecture um, that colonization with bacteria is very common and that there's actually 10 bacterial cells on the human body for every one human cell. Therefore, you could stick a swab in your mouth right now and you could gram stain it and you'd see organisms, but that doesn't mean that you have an infection in your mouth. It just means that bacteria live in there. So it's gonna really be up to you as a clinician to decide in what situations is the identification of a bacteria, for example, is suggestive of a true infection versus colonization. Here again um, is an example using Staph aureus. If you swab somebody's nose, you may identify Staph aureus, but that doesn't mean it's causing infection. It may just be colonizing the nose. However, if you have a person who has a big abscess in the thigh and there's pus sleeping at, uh, weeping out and you culture and you, you find Staph aureus is much more likely to be in a pathogenic state. Serologic testing is another means, and this is an example I'm using is dengue fever. Dengue is a virus, which is one of the most common causes of fever in returning travelers from many parts of the world. And we often use serologic testing or the body's immune response uh, to make the diagnosis. We've most commonly used a positive IgM result, which usually you can detect around day four or so after illness um, to make that diagnosis. Um, and then it goes down over time. IgG becomes positive and usually stays positive for life. We've been using though, um, as the technology becomes available, we can actually use uh, PCR testing to detect viremia even earlier. Um, and we don't have to necessarily rely on uh, antibody response. What are the limitations of waiting for antibody tests? Well, it may be slow, as I just showed you. You might get, um, you might be ill and not have mounted that IgM response yet. So you get a false negative. Um, your, your test for patients, for example, who have um, been infected with a pathogen once um, and then might be get infected again, that antibody response um, might not be helpful. Um, or it may be cross-reactive with other organisms. There's certain bacteria and viruses that are so closely related to each other that they'll actually stimulate an antibody response um, that um, cross-reacts with one another. And then if you have patients who have an abnormal immune system, it's possible that their immune system just isn't smart enough to make an antibody response. So then you, again, may get a false negative.
Another type of testing that I just wanted to touch on real briefly is something called antigen-based testing. Antigen is when you're looking at something that a organism might release um, to make that diagnosis. So the example I'm using here, this is Aspergillus fumigatus. This is a narrow angle branching septated hyphae that in immunocompromised patients can cause lots of different diseases, but most classically invasive lung infection. And you can see here these white spots. These are cavitary lung lesions um, and uh, suggestive of infection. Antigen testing can be really helpful, um, and usually what happens is there are antibodies that are produced by a company um, that manufactures a test that actually will test fluid for blood, for example, um, and have antibodies directed against these antigens, and if it's positive, you know that those antigens are there. Lastly, I'm just going to touch on the molecular testing. We've been using PCR testing um, more and more to help identify organisms. You can use um, lots of different PCR testing. Some that we've been using to identify pathogens more recently are 16S ribosomal sequencing for bacteria, 18S ribosomal sequencing uh, for fungi, and it's been able us allowed us to identify organisms when culture and staining techniques have been negative because it has enhanced sensitivity. I think over the next decade, we're gonna be seeing less culture used and more of this molecular testing to be making diagnosis. And I think the field's really gonna be uh, changing and we're gonna see a lot of really exciting changes.